let's kick off uh, because we're now at 10.30 UAE time. It is the 2nd of June. Uh, it is by coincidence, not by design, but we like when uh, these uh, serendipitous moments come together uh, where we have our monthly uh, uh, podcast, Month in Review, Month Ahead, but it is the day of the OPEC Plus meeting. And we've got Brent crude oil uh, trading in the lower end of the range that we've seen in recent uh, days, but uh, sort of closing out the week down above $81 a barrel. And this has been a consistent trend since the uh, early April when we kind of peaked above $90 a barrel, $94, give or take a few dollars above uh, for Brent. And it's been a steady decline since. There's been a lot of noise over the last few days that OPEC Plus, uh, they're now gathering in Riyadh today, all the reporting indicating what was going to be an, uh, originally an in-person meeting in Vienna, then became a virtual meeting, and now is back to an in-person meeting in uh, Riyadh, but not of all 22 countries in OPEC Plus, but those, it seems, that are attached to the voluntary cuts. But nonetheless, a lot of jawboning going on, I suspect, to get around an idea. Uh, and uh, let's kick off with Mike Muller, head of Vitol Asia. Mike, your thoughts and expectations, what OPEC might need to be considering if they want to see a kind of an average that we've seen in the first half of the year, $83, $84 Brent, continue through to the end of the year. What do they need to be thinking about in order to sort of achieve that sort of level of supply demand balance in the market? Demand in one word. So the conventional wisdom for the past few months has been that year on year demand is up sufficiently so that OPEC plus the 22 countries may be able to allow themselves to put some volume back in the market without destabilizing a price in the 80s. Um, now, that's not been a phenomenon right now, and I'll come on to spot markets in a, in, a, in a short while, but there's always been a consensus that in the peak demand period in the in the Northern Hemisphere, in the European and North American summer, there would be sufficient demand and therefore sufficient pull on inventories to allow a, a scenario where people see a slight tightening of balances, and that, that would, would provide that sort of prospect. Now, what we're actually seeing on demand is extremely high levels of product oil product inventory on the water, which have been drawing down, a perception of high inventories in important markets like China, and a, I guess in most people's minds, a slightly downward revision in year-on-year -year demand estimates from admittedly very high levels to start with, which should have underpinned that first, uh, that first scenario I painted where the world was likely to go into a stock draw. So one felt that there should be space for there to be extra volume to come to the market. But I think the consensus in the market remains that we continue to roll over. Um, however, we'll see in just under five hours time in Vienna, what actually, sorry, in Riyadh, in Riyadh, what actually, well, listen, then um, what actually transpires. Um, but the uh, critical thing was that um, OPEC Plus had commissioned three consulting firms, Reistad, IHS, and Woodmac, to come up with a, a verifiable set of production capabilities for the 22 countries of which discussions will then be based. Um, there was talk that I've seen online that uh, there was a request for a draft, an early version of that report, in order to better inform today's meeting. I I'm not sure if that's going to result in any any uh, new, uh, new signaling, um, but one would suspect that this report will tell us what we already know, which is that many OPEC nations, African nations, for example, don't have the capacity to produce at their baseline, but others that have heavily invested of late, such as the UAE, will have uh, continued space and therefore there has to be a discussion around what, 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 to how those uh, extra capacities translate into any new numbers. I'm not sure all that's going to transpire today. I think uh, the market is expecting there to be very little by way of news and a rollover. Let's welcome uh, our Christoph Rule, Senior Research Scholar, Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University. Christoph, it's always, I mean, it's its difficult to look in the crystal ball out six months as OPEC Plus are doing today. Uh, it seems the reporting indicating that they're looking beyond what had been expected to be a simple sort of three-month rollover as they had done in March. 
But as they look out to the second half of the year, as we all look out to the second half of the year, one of the big unknowns is, are central banks going to start loosening uh, monetary policy and with that uh, support economic growth and perhaps uh, bigger demand to call on oil? Your thoughts on the decisions that OPEC Plus are facing today? I think they might well look out further, but uh, the key problem, of course, is how to unwind the existing cuts. And that key problem goes back to what Mike has mentioned, namely the expectations of demand, which come in lower now. And uh, I think we should give or you should give your forum here, a monthly forum, some credit, or I feel vindicated at least that these demand numbers, which we have discussed a few months ago, have really turned out to be overestimates. Now, from the link to the macro and the oil, this is interesting because over the last months, the oil markets and oil market analysts have very closely observed their macro colleagues and what they were saying about interest rates and, uh, and have sort of always, when you read any oil market reports, followed the expectations of interest rates, will be cut, will not be cut, will be cut, will not be cut, translated that into good times for the economy, bad times for the economy, and high and low oil demand. Usually it's true, you know, that oil demand and therefore prices are determined by economic growth and economic development. But very often it's also useful to look at it the other way around, not in terms of causality, but in terms of what oil demand can tell us about the state of the economy. And what we are seeing there now is exactly as Mike described, we had a crude oil draw, but we have sort of stock built in distillates, very importantly, and also in gasoline. And that indicates that economic activity is actually lower than uh, most people would, would indicate, or, or that, that it is slowing down, that economic growth in particular in the US is no longer as strong as it was. Uh, so when you take that together into this interest rate picture, not much attention seems to be paid by it. And that, of course, opens up the possibility that the Fed keeps rates low too long too high. You know the old saying that, Nine of the past 10 recessions have been created by the Fed and the interest rate policy. We are seeing in energy market, in particular in oil market data, the first indicators of a slowdown more clearly, uh, as is often the case, uh, than in other indicators, in particular with these constant massive data revisions of macro data in the US. Now, I think this is not lost on OPEC. And so that makes their problem really uh, harder to solve. So they have those, these cuts of almost 6 million OPEC plus, you know, 2 million in OPEC. They have a number of members who have expanded production capacity. Uh, top of the line is the UAE. And they have a desire to keep a stabilized market, as they call it, to keep prices up, which would require more cuts for the rest of this year, maintenance at least of existing cuts for 2025, from all we can say. And if there's a slowdown in growth, then more cuts for 2025 as well. And they have the desire of individual members to see at least a clear path towards a uh, you know, being free to produce again. Because all the while, and that's another aspect, while they are keeping these cuts, not OPEC plus members, of course, gain market share. And that threatens to become quite irreversible as these productions in Guyana, in Brazil, in the US get cheaper and cheaper by the day. So it's very hard how to see a way out of that from the outside. And I bet it's even harder from the inside. And what I would expect is, unfortunately, some more of this kind of convoluted messages, which we have sometimes seen in the past when the situation became really dicey and tricky. You know, people making statements, which the market then tries to translate into numbers. And, and all of that just leads to the overall impression that they are in a corner. And that would be bad. For yeah. Them. Mike, I mean, thinking about the, the, the market outlook, what would be dry? I mean, obviously, we know that OPEC Plus has to get to a, a, a restructuring of the baseline quotas by the end of the year, because that's when the agreement expires. Is there anything or what would you think would be propelling dealing with it now or doing an agreement that reaches into 2025, as is some of the reporting indicating? Uh, your thoughts on the market's what sort of signals you would take from that? Is the market looking for that far out uh, commitment already? Uh, your thoughts on, on on the timing, what that needs, what it needs now rather than moving it to 25? 
I don't see any particular trigger why there should be any any added urgency other than the fact that we're getting towards mid-year and people are beginning to ask questions about balance of year and looking beyond the peak summer demand period already. And uh, and I guess there's plenty of talk. And the talk has been fueled by some rather high-profile uh, publications by various consulting firms. I mean, I'll remind everyone, OPEC see peak oil around 2040 plus at 140 million barrels a day, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Goldman Sachs, uh, who uh, have been closely associated with the concept of peak oil in their latest report, revised upwards their demand for oil in 2030 from 106 to 108 and a half million barrels a day and projected their peak oil in 2034, which is a little beyond where most people have it. And they're peaking at 110 million barrels a day and plateauing there. Um, JP Morgan then came up with a forecast that was also somewhat more, more bullish for the natural gas complex and has prices staying in the 80s this year and tailing off into the 70s next year. Um, put alongside that a report that we need to give a little bit more um, credence to, I think, um, a Sinopec, so the biggest refiner in China, if not in the world, um, who for domestic forecasting purposes, put out a peak oil demand year of 2027, just two years away. So on the one for hand, we've got the for China. China, for China only, yes. But they don't see peak gas until 2040, incidentally, and peak coal this year. Um, so, I mean, China uh, forecasting and baking in a, a very advanced pace of electrification and renewables, but um, the Western or the Wall Street uh, banks and consulting firms are all looking at a, a slowing pace, um, uh, uh, somewhat dissipating the, uh, the forecasts of electric vehicle penetration, but also electrification of, of industries. So those, those, divi those divergences are somewhat... Um, uh, polarizing opinion, but also stimulating debate as to where we stand. Uh, I promise to talk about the spot markets a little bit. I mean, what we're seeing yeah. in crude is a market that's uh, that's amply supplied in the Atlantic Basin, as you would gl glance at a screen, not just looking at $81 something Brent, but looking at the structure of the market, which has lost a lot of the backwardation that it used to have. Now, on a forward basis, there's still plenty of backwardation, which is a structure that OPEC Plus tend to like the look of. Um, but in the prompt, we have to worry about... Um, surpluses which may be temporary or maybe less so um so as one bellwether you look at how much atlantic basin oil uh, u.s exports and west african oil move to asia and that pull from asia has been somewhat slower um and the big question on people's minds now is is there going to be some catching up or not mike just quickly to, to follow up i just sorry christopher i just want to get mike's view on why the oil price has dropped from the the 90s, you know, over the last six weeks, seven weeks, or two months now since above 94. I mean, OPEC must be trying to figure out why that drop has come off so quickly over eight, six, eight weeks. And, 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 and will it stop or does it continue to fall? Is this a hot knife through butter? What are your thoughts on the why of that drop off and, and, and as, it, as it found its finish now? I'm sure Christopher is equally qualified on this one, but I'll just say yeah. two things. When we went into the 90s, which is some time ago, there was a lot yeah. more geopolitical fizz in the market. There were a lot more concerns around the, the Israel-Hamas conflict in Gaza and whether that went, might have further ramifications. And the only real factor that has resulted from that, people are assuming that there won't be a proliferation of conflict beyond that particular area, has been the disruption to supplies caused by the Houthis at the um, Bab al-Mandeb or the, the Straits of Aden. Um, and therefore, this massive stock builds on the water as ships go the long way around the bottom of Africa. Um, so that's that's the reason we're from 90s to 80s. And as for whether we're in the low 80s, the mid 80s or thereabouts, I, I don't think these price moves have been particularly profound. But yes, as we commented three, four weeks ago on this call, uh, there have been some downward revisions in year on year demand, but from a very, very high base. I mean, we had started out and we were just a few months ago calling 2024, uh, I think one of the top four highest year on year demand growth for oil ever seen and we still have ahead of us driving season um a u.s driving season that's forecast to look pretty good and probably the highest ever use of jet fuel the world's ever seen as we enter into northern hemisphere holiday season christoph i wanted to get your thought which is picking up on that point mike made uh, the idea of what might be accelerating or bringing forward the bigger decisions that we were expecting later the year, the fact that we're convening in Riyadh when it was supposed to be a virtual meeting and so forth. Uh, we've had the UAE signal quite strongly in recent weeks that they are now at close to 5 million barrels a day capacity. Your thoughts on the, uh, the, the appetite to deal with this issue now rather than wait 
till the end of the year of where the UAE position might be. Obviously, they're carrying by that data about 2 million barrels of idle capacity a day now. Well, it was not just a hint. It was basically an official announcement not that they have increased their capacity. So what I think what we have seen, as we discussed four weeks ago, is a corridor which really is the 80s. You know, it's between 80 and 90, temporarily blips above, maybe a short fall. And it's like we discussed last time, driven there's a floor driven by these, supported by these cuts, by production volumes. And then there's volatility driven by a geopolitical risk premium, if you wish, which comes and goes very quickly, given the enormous amount of spare capacity in the system. And uh, what happened is every time you had an event up to the 90s or so on the back of attacks against the Russian refining system and an escalation of the situation in Gaza, remember, remember the Iranian attacks on Israel and all of that. And, and it went down again when that situation comforted itself. So that's, I think, a pretty clear uh, nexus here that the oil market short-term volatility goes in line with these two hotspots. Over the longer term, what we have is that uh, that of course, you know, the, the the key to whether these cuts can be extended or even maintained lies in the UAE on the one side and Russia on the other side. You know? Russia would be sort of the obvious candidate who has a lot to gain from taking cuts more seriously. And but given its track record in the past from the publications we see it has a uh, a much less convincing track record, let's say, than the UAE. The UAE will clearly wish to use more of its capacity, but probably has always at the end been a team player, uh, one of the one of the pillars of OPEC and has always stuck to agreements uh, as far as we can tell. So that's uh, going to be the balance. And then there are these countries in between from Kazakhstan to I don't know who else, those are invited now to Riyadh probably, which are beneficiaries uh, of other people's cuts, but not big cutters themselves and not always the best sort of in, in most reliable ones in implementation. And that soup is currently being cooked in Riyadh, and it's going really to be a very difficult undertaking. And these other discussions about peak oil, and so these are really long-term discussions. That will be a, but it's important. What to about keep it in the mind. what about the, uh, the 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 monetary policy outlook? I mean, the side can OPEC plan for the second half of the year that the easing cycle won't begin before twenty-five, or should they bet in that actually these cuts will begin? Uh, in the second half, and of how to be guided by that. From what I said earlier, it could well be that the cuts come in September or the first cut come in September as the market bets, but it will. It may well be the case that this does not result in a sudden spur of economic growth. It may well be the case that we have passed the peak of economic growth in the US. Uh, we have stabilization in China. And so then the Fed, Fed will feel more comfortable to cut, but it the mistake of many analysts is to translate that and the exuberance in stock markets a cut will cause, translate that into increased oil demand, because that link may not be there because of already lower growth. And that would fit into now what we're discussing, the revisions to demand and the very high, extremely high and over-optimistic OPEC forecasts for demand it would indicate that they have miscalculated. They have miscalculated in the sense that they thought demand would be higher and, and additionally probably accelerated by uh, Federal Reserve interest rate cuts. That's where the high projection comes from of the research arm, at least. And that may not materialize, as I said, because growth may already over the top. Be over Let's the go top. to the survey question, which uh, addresses this point of um, OPEC plus needs to at least maintain all current output cuts through the second half to sustain the $83 year average year to date for the rest of 2024, that at least they've got to maintain the current cuts through the second half, all of the second half, in order to maintain this average that they've achieved thus far. Um, Mike, we've seen uh, reports uh, over the end of last week that Asia's imports of crude oil rose to the highest in 12 months in May. Uh, uh, with uh, reaching uh, 27, nearly 28 million barrels, uh, driven more by an increase in India than China, per se. But your thoughts as a whole, Asia's demand 
uh, being a, a, a supporting pillar that could even grow further in the second half of the year if China starts to come back stronger. Uh, the outlook for the second half from an Asian demand point of view and what OPEC Plus can think about that. Yes, very topical question. Um, I think we have a bunch of phenomena here, but uh, the May data you're referring to is of no interest to traders anymore because we're trading July, August already. Um, yeah. And the situation is pretty much as outlined for July and August. We have uh, adequate stocks on the water of refined products, and we have slightly, I'll emphasize slightly less pull on Atlantic Basin imports from Asia, maybe as a consequence of a little bit of overpurchasing that you referred to there in, in May. That said, the outlook in economies like India uh, are and continue to be robust. I mean, you will have seen not just the elections, but the record weather temperatures. Um, these in, in advanced Asian nations tend to lead to increased demands in air conditioning usage and therefore place extreme strain on the power grid, sometimes necessitating uses of energies other than those obvious ones. Right. So Japan will go from burning LNG to maybe having to burn uh, burn fuel in order to make up local local shortfalls. Um, however, the heat is in India, of course, and uh, and there it could have different consequences. It could affect crops and harvests and mean less diesel, less diesel that gets consumed by, by tractors if the fields aren't fertile. So there are many, many possible pathways this can take. But I think on the whole, the outlook for gas feels very much buoyed by these, uh, by these uh, heat events. Um, but if you want to look any further than what's happening on products, oil products in Asia, you look at refining margins and look in particular at gasoline cracks. And these are trading at uh, multi-year lows. If you strip out the COVID period of 2020, 2021, Singapore gasoline has been generally trading at double digit per barrel premium to Brent what we call the crack, a big component of the margin, and that's sunk to negligible single digits. So we're at uh, all-time lows on that particular front, and that doesn't bode particularly well, even though there was a view that gasoline demand growth is particularly robust in places like China. And then you look at what that means for refinery behavior, and refiners, of course, will be very quick to advertise that they might consider cutting runs in order to soften the view of the the, the crude oil sellers that they're facing. Um, and uh, it is that time of month when we are... <laughs> At the beginning of the month and programs get nominated and people call for how much OPEC oil they wish to see in their buying programs. So you generally hear a little bit more noise at this time of month from those refiners that have marginal capacity as to whether they'll be running that capacity or not. And, and that's the sentiment right now, which is a little softer. Mike, just to follow up on that, we have a question in the chat room. Uh, we're looking for a comment on the Middle East is putting 1.5 million barrels a day of products more to the market. Uh, this year, and, and that is an is indirect way to to crude exports. How, where do you see those two things intersecting? Well, demand growth is up globally by at least that much. So the market needs that capacity. And there aren't many other places in the world outside China where refinery capacity has been added. If anything, I think uh, there's been much made of the fact that the global refining system is old and more susceptible to disruptions. So I don't think that in itself poses a problem. It, it, it's bullish shipping because, of course, the extra product made in the Middle East has to find its way further afield. And you'll see a whole bunch of references to clean freight rates being high, whereas dirty freight rates are less so. And uh, ships, therefore, being incentivized to, to clean up in order to perform those voyages that need to take the, the clean refined products from the Middle East to largely the, the Atlantic Basin and, and Northeast Chris Asia, Stop. of course. Christoph, you know, one of the things that we've been looking at in recent years as a driver, you know, the IMF even mentioned it earlier uh, last month that uh, the Saudi Arabia needs a $96 oil price, I think it was, in order to balance their budget. Uh, and they are running fiscal deficit uh, and have announced recently plans to back away from some of the mega, what they call giga projects and, and the huge commitments, at least from a time frame point of view. I'm wondering, Christoph, your thoughts of where is Saudi's tolerance maybe, or its its ability to cater for a lower oil price than maybe previously as identified by IMF, that they may back off the pedal a little bit. Your thoughts, Christoph? Well, there's two considerations, one short term and one long term. In the short term, when you look at Saudi history and Saudi financial history in particular, they have no problem with running deficits for a prolonged period of times. They know what they have under the ground. Uh, they are flexible, you know, both in, in the sense of, of organizing and announcing mega projects and of scaling them down if they have them, if they have to. So 
in their internal budgetary policies, it's actually a quite stable place, I would think. How that translates into into their oil policy and to what an extent oil policy is also, I would think, driven by long-term considerations. The longer-term issue with Saudi Arabia here is uh, is again, you know, how to how to deal with a situation, or they know that they can deal with a situation where we have peak oil. So, but but in the sense that this will be a competition, a race to the bottom, a competition for producing oil at the cheapest price possible in order to retain market share. And uh, the, the Gulf countries will be the ultimate winners of that contest. So even from that perspective, there is not really much much reason for them to lose to lose confidence right now. So I would not expect any sort of sudden nervousness or attacks to, so in, in South, from Saudi Arabia's budget considerations to reflect on the oil market immediately. Christoph, just to follow up on you mentioned earlier that the two sort of hot spots, the geopolitical hot spots, both you and Mike seem to be aligned on the idea that you know that the, the fall off of the price from the low nineties to the low eighties over the last two months has been driven mainly by the kind of diffusing of the geopolitical crisis. Um, but we have had overnight and, and sort of an interesting contradiction in ways, two stories. One, that the Russians are attacking Ukrainian energy infrastructure. Uh, and at the same, in a separate report uh, on the amount of gas that Russia are going to send through the Ukrainian pipeline next month or this month. Um, your thoughts on that energy infrastructure, on the war, the, the news that Ukraine could attack deeper into Russia with permission from the U.S. to use those weapons. How this theater looks to you like going into the summer months as, as a potential disruptor that the oil market should pay attention to or not? Well, yeah, again, there's two things. There is something which we know traditionally from all sorts of wars, which is that one way of attacking somebody else is to destroy his infrastructure, including the energy infrastructure in places which are cold, you know, that's even more important than uh, and have little own resources than usually. So that's what Russia does in a massive sort of way. And that pushes Ukraine in a corner if they cannot defend themselves uh, adequately. The other side is the other story here is that we are also seeing something which is legitimately referred to as economic warfare, which started in 2014 with the first occupation of Crimea and which proceeded after the invitation after the invasion of, of the Ukraine by Russia, first on the financial sector with freezing, surprise freeze of all the Russian reserves. It took some months and it took some audacious moves from Russia in, in regard to pipeline deliveries of gas to Europe to really for this to engulf the energy sector. Now we have all these uh, sanctions against Russia. And I mean, Russia's oil and gas exports and coal exports, fossil fuel exports, amount to 12% of global cross-border energy trade. And the G7, which is sort of the collective West opposing that, produces more than half of global GDP. So it's a colossal battle there for the, for the energy flows. Uh, and I'm afraid the G7 is losing it because they have made it very clear from the beginning that they want to have the cake and eat it too. So they want to have sanctions against Russia's oil revenues, but they don't want to curb the oil revenues. That puts countries like India and China at a huge disadvantage, which we should also mention when we look at their demand figures, because the oil is relatively cheap. But it also means that by, by with all the attempts with the price cap and with the intervening and the shadow fleet and so, the West is always caught when push comes to shelf, they would have to do something to limit these exports, and they don't. Now, where does this lead us? If I combine the two things, Ukraine potentially in a corner over the summer, very different picture from last summer, <laughs> summer, and the West not willing to really massively intervene into Russian exports, that leaves Ukraine the option of doing it themselves. So that would mean that Ukraine continues attacking refinery structure, export terminals, pipelines, whatever they can from out of Russia in order to sort of uh, cut on Russian revenues from, from that side. How effective this can be, I think it could be quite effective if they really were desperate and would use these weapons. What I'm saying here is really more of a warning. Imagine an election outcome in the US with Trump becoming president, trying to support you know, a quick end to the war at the expense of Ukraine. Then Ukraine with its arsenal might decide you know, to give it one last go and to really damage Russian sort of revenue generation and export infrastructure and to generate a crisis with very high oil prices or at yeah. least use it as a threat to their own friends. And that's quite 
it's quite it would be quite a scenario, but it's not. Unfair. Yeah, I think that I think the summer does present. I mean, the, the Ukraine theater in particular, uh, some pr pr some uncertainty that could be uh, disruptive. Mike, I wanted to give you the last word on China. We can never uh, let you go without giving a sense of China, and I I, I reference the. Uh, the IMF revision upwards in their GDP forecast for China this year. Last week, they rose their forecast by 0.4%. Uh, how should the OPEC Plus meeting today look to China for the second half of the year and its incremental demand growth? Should they read much into the IMF numbers? Does China look like it's finally getting its feet again? Your thoughts on the second half of the year for China oil demand? It's terribly difficult. I always chime in on the more bullish, constructive side when it comes to China, and that's not just because I'm sitting in Asia. Um, I wouldn't read too much into that 0.4%. I uh, I think we need to look at the, the bare facts across all commodities, industrial commodities, and uh, China might have positive growth indicators now in its manufacturing sector for, for several months already. Um, but I think we need to continue trading cautiously when trying to make predictions for energy demand growth. As I said a while back, I think demand for China importing gas looks a little bit more healthy. But on the oil side, they are amongst those refiners talking about potentially conducting run cuts because onshore inventories are, are adequate. But if I may, and you're the journalist, you might love this, Sean, here, literally 80 meters that way in the Shangri-La Hotel ballroom, we had the Chinese defense minister this morning make some comments that were quite, uh, quite firm relating to Taiwan and the new government there, which he referred to as separatist. And uh, I mean, go look it up on the headlines, but these comments may be perceived by the world as slightly more hawkish than expected. And there've been various retorts and comments around South China Sea as well with Ferdinand Marcos here, um, future president of Indonesia, and, uh, and Zelensky just flew in also. So he's two kilometers that way uh, in the presidential palace. So I'm in one of the best protected places in the world right now, um, but there are several headlines emanating from this 21st Global Defense Ministers Conference, where just about all of them are here. Uh, which which are worthy of a glance over the weekend. Yeah, the the Taiwan comments I saw them. They're clearly uh, more robust than than has been, and and uh, that's obviously a space that has to be watched as well. Um, we're going to have to leave it there. As we say, the meeting in Vienna, in Vienna, not Vienna, the virtual Vienna, the Riyadh Vienna at. Um, uh, 3 p.m. Uh, UAE time. I think that's 1 p.m. Vienna time. Uh, the meeting will begin in, in Riyadh. And, and so we'll wait to see what they come up with. It's consensus of this poll that we've had. I won't put the boys on the spot as to give a forecast of it. But the consensus here, at least uh, in this room today, appears that uh, they need to, OPEC Plus would be wise to put a six month extension on their cuts in order to maintain the average oil price they've got so far, which at 83, 84, I think everybody would be relatively happy with. Uh, but any unraveling of cuts sooner, i.e. in the next three months, might see oil continue its downward draft. But we'll have to wait and see. As always, Mike Muller, head of Vitol Asia, it's wonderful to see you and uh, look forward to our final before the summer break in early July. Christoph Rule. As always, Senior Research Scholar, Center of Global Energy Policy at Columbia University. Thank you so much, Christoph. Look forward to seeing you guys all soon again. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <clears throat> Bye, all.